Most of you are who watching this video, I'm sure you work on a microservice project in any manner. Either you are a software engineer who developed that or a QA engineer who uh, tested it or a BA or a PM or somewhere you may have a, some sort of a touch for a microservice project. I have a small question for you. If you take one of your services from your project, are those services doing it at best or is there any window to improve those services? Do you think those services are running in optimum level, the best performance it can give? I don't think most cases answer is yes. Also I have other question for you. When those services talk into each other, inter-service communication, are they use HTTP? Then probably you may have a window to improve those services. Your performance may get double or triple if you do some architectural changes to your services. Today, we are going to talk about one of the most requested video, that is event-driven architecture. How we can do it right, how we can use event-driven architecture on a microservice project. So, why we need event-driven architecture? Most of our projects, most of our services are running on HTTP-based uh, communication. So that means when one service needs to talk to other service, we use HTTP to communicate be uh, between services. But REST mean to be asynchronous. When we look at the SOAP and REST, we always SOAP is asynchronous and the REST is asynchronous. But as long as you use the HTTP to communicate, it is not really asynchronous. Why? Because HTTP is a synchronous protocol. We discussed this in HTTP videos and we discussed in a many times on our, on our previous TCP HTTP videos. So I'm not going to go there, but HTTP is an asynchronous protocol, at least if you're using 1.1. So now, being a synchronous protocol, when you're trying to have gain performance, you have a bottleneck, you hit there, you stuck there. Why? Because because of the limitation of HTTP protocol, you can't implement the real asynchronous nature. Not only that, we face scalability issues also for some extent when we use HTTP-based communication. Why? Let's take it to service A and service B. Service A talk to service B. This is a one request to service B, right? But service B may need to do more and more processing to get the work done. Until that processing comes, these request is holding up on the service B, right? This can even cause with cascading failures. We discussed this many times on the microservice based architecture, so I'm not going to dig into that in this video. So now we have two problems. It's asynchronous protocol, so we create a bottleneck, and also we have a scalability issues because of when you send the request, backend cannot offload the work because of the because all those works are belong to one request. The third problem is we have a tight coupling. Why? Now service A has the, all the knowledge about the service B. When the service B URL change, when the service B contract change, no matter what, service A has to know about it. Because a service A should know how I should talk to service B, what are the payload I should send, what are the parameters I need to pass. These are tight coupling between service A and B. Service B cannot independently change its payload architecture or anything. Why? Because the moment it does, the service A fail. So that means we have a tight coupling as well. Now, opposite of that, why asynchronous communication is important? First and most important thing is a decoupling services. So now service A and service B don't talk to each other directly. So they talk, they communicate via a message broker. So they're very decoupled. Service A can scale independently and service B can scale independently. And service A doesn't have a tight coupling with the B so they can work independently on their payload and structures and everything. Why? Then you can publish and consume from a different version on different topics. So that freedom is very important when you really work on the production system. Up until you go to production, you're fine. But when you go to the production, after you go to the production, post-production is really hard to change things. So it's really important decoupled architecture. Next important thing is a resilience. That is also a kind of a side effect of decoupling. Why? In our previous model, in HTTP-based communication, when the service A look for a service B, if the service B is not available, then service A cannot continue. It has only two options. One, either it has to completely fail the request or else it has to implement very complicated retry mechanism. Whenever service B available, it need to uh, resume the transaction and then complete the rest of the thing. It's, it, I mean, uh, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. But in this model, you have a solution for that, right? Why now A and B communicate via a message broker. If when the A look for a B, A directly doesn't look for a B at all, right? So A says, okay, this happened. So it goes to message broker. If the B is not available, it's totally fine. A don't care about it, right? A can continue with work. 
now when the b whenever b available maybe even two days later when the b available it can fetch the message and do its work so now it's completely decoupled so each one can restart deploy anything at any given time why no one is depending directly on them and third one is because of the non-blocking call we have a performance gain now if you have a hundred requests you don't have to wait until the response comes you can directly send the request and you can continue your work whenever that happen whenever request is processed your previous request process you will get the response and you can continue the rest of the step now you have a performance gain because you are not executing any blocking calls now here is the thing most of developers, most of software engineers misunderstand event-driven architecture with the messaging architecture. These are two different things. Messaging means one service talk, send a message to other service. That can be direct point-to-point -point communication or else they may use something like a queue. So one service send a message to the queue and other service take the message from the queue. That is a messaging framework. It is not event-driven architecture. Event-driven architecture means you emit an event after something happened. It can be someone logged into the system. It can be someone uh, enable or disable a record. It can be someone create a record, update a record, delete a record. Any after any state change, you emit the event to tell this has happened, right? So the important thing is that has happened already. So now we are saying an event. There may be or may not be some other service who are interested about this event. If they interest about it, they will take it and do something what they want. If they don't interest it, it doesn't matter. You published an event. So that is an event-based architecture or an event-driven architecture. Messaging system, you send the message and then the consumer will take the message. Another important thing is in the messaging system, once you read the message, the message is deleted, right? So you send the message to the queue, the consumer consume the message, now message is gone. Why? Because it's consumed. But in the, in the event-driven architecture, when you send the message to a broker, it's immutable. So you can change it. You can update the content of the message because it happened. It's, it's, it's about the event, right? The so event has already happened. It's a past. You can change it. So that is the most important thing. Event driven architecture, event is always immutable. So then the consumer can take it and process it. In simple, messaging architecture can be used directly request response pattern or a queue, but event driven architecture use a message broker, something like a Kafka. Now here you can see difference between messaging and the event, right? Messaging always you submit to the queue and the consume from the queue and then message get deleted. But in the message broker pattern or as an event driven pattern, you emit the event, it go to the event broker and event broker decide to whom uh, we, this event should give because if the if the consumer is not available when the consumer come back broker knows what was the last message this consumer consume and it can deliver the message from there this model also known as a pub sub pattern why there's a publisher and then publisher publish the message and then message go to the message broker and consumer consume the messages right so that's why it's a pub sub pattern there are three entities on the event driven solution one is a publisher and second one is the broker and third one is the consumer so until the consumer consume the message message stays with the broker why is a pub sub because as a consumer it can decide what are the topics it's interesting on so they can subscribe to those topics and the consumer will get only messages from those topics so that's why we call this a pop sub pattern and there are a couple of products available to do that the most popular and the most efficient one is the apache kafka so that is a very now to do uh, this type of jobs and also you have aws sqs sns and those are the way you configured it matters SQS and SNS but when it comes to Kafka we learn this can be done easily why because uh, we can use different different topic based on the subject and within the topic we can use a partition and in the partition we process message parallelly but within the partition we process message sequentially Kafka is ideal product to do this type of event driven architecture so now where we can use this we, there are multiple use cases you can use this in your project one if you want to use auditing right audit trials because when something happens you emit event and then audit trial uh, take that event and uh, do the lo audit logging and then also we can use a data sync we discuss about the cdc and also we can uh, use inter-service communication also we can use for notification and email sending so why because email sending is kind of a, a passive process so you can do something and you can emit an event then then email service will receive the e uh, event and send the email why because you don't have to wait until 
email is delivered you don't have to wait until notification is delivered because you decide to send a notification so you emit an event you go because sending notification sending email updating something is a completely disconnected from your business process so you can uh, you use there and also you can use this for batch processes and you also use background processes for example something happened you can submit to the messaging broker saying okay this happened go and process this as in a background so then your front end service or your ui uh, requests are not waiting until this huge load is processed it's completely decoupled from your main process and now it's running in the background obviously there are so many pros we already discussed on this event driven architecture we is very scalable and it's easy to handle the loads and independently scalable services resilience is in build why because uh, service can restart or service doesn't need to know about any other services and also uh, it's, a, it's a decentralized knowledge because now one service can only know about that service it doesn't aware about other services it only knows the message broker to emit the event that's it so so many advantages uh, on this event driven architecture but event driven architecture is not fit all solution why because there are some disadvantages of event driven architecture as well most significant disadvantage is now when something happen little after a while maybe milliseconds little after a while only other service know this has happened so that is the main disadvantage why because the event has to emit event has to go to the broker broker has to send it to the consumer then only consumer aware about this so this lead to something like eventual consistency why because it i mean it's millisecond but this millisecond sometimes matters so you need to make sure this doesn't break your business flow when you use the event driven architecture and also if you're not carefully designed this can bite you back because this can be very complex and complicated why because event can collide why because let's say you send the first event that event is supposed to consume before the second event emit but now event couldn't for some reason event couldn't process until the second event comes so now you have a problem second event came first before the first event so now you have to handle that so this type of complexity are there but you can easily manage those by carefully architecturing your event structure if you do that this is a really really uh, nice thing to work with but if you do it wrong if you try to if without a proper design without a proper architecture if you try to jump and uh, create events then believe me very soon you are going to struggle with the event collisions so there are best practices we use uh, when we do event driven design and event driven architecture especially to avoid those disadvantages and those complications and the problem first thing is you have to have a perfect design that design should cater the eventual consistency concept and also it's better to use the item port and consumer so in that case when something happened if in case event is missed it is not scared or it is not worrying to reprocess it or retry it because it's item port and consumer also sometimes very edge cases during the communication issues and during the synchronization issues same event can come twice it's very rare case but it is possible because of the previous event act not received properly if the previous events heartbeat not received properly if the prevent uh, previous event session timeout not handled properly then the same event can come back so your consumer should aware about this duplicate event handling and next complicated thing is the monitoring because when you have a system huge system with the uh, hundreds of thousands of events firing here and there even monitoring is little bit complicated so therefore in your architecture you need to make sure you have enough tags and tracings and the logs to trace the events for that use you can use like a grafana or prometheus so there are enough product to do that but your architecture should support it and one other thing is you need to make sure you define the event contract and the versioning properly in case your payload change in the publisher need to change the payload how they can do it they need to publish a new version or they need to go for a completely different topic or uh, the the message carrying the version or, or is it do something like a arrow schema you have to have a proper architecture to understand how your event should design and architecture another thing is make sure this is the most critical thing out of everything make sure all your engineers all your developers all your qas and if possible bas and the consultants are aware about the event driven architecture and how those event process in my personal experience most problem i was facing to communicate with the bas and the consultant about these events because they are not coming from the technical background in their world what they have learned is kind of a basic synchronous programming like you write to the database and then you do this and you do that so when when you are saying this happening event it might really hard to communicate with them so it's better to have a like kind of a 
a few tech talks and few uh, ramping up sessions with them kind of a show. You, you don't have to go to in detail but at least basis of event driven architecture that will be a key successor to your project now we discuss various factors how to do that and advantages and disadvantages and everything i hope now you can go back to your project and think where i can implement event driven architecture so start with a very small thing don't try to convert entire your project to event driven architecture because that's not going to work so start with a very small thing probably notification probably email so that is the ideal use case to start and then do it and see how it does then one by one one by one add so go and see most lows and most painful places then onboard those to your event driven architecture then you will see success in front of your eyes very soon so then i hope you will do it and if you have any question anything any feedback comment below and also make sure uh, click on this like button because that would be the encouragement to do the next video so then see you soon until then stay safe and take care